church. Morning. It would be a joy to see your faces this morning. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, we are here. We acknowledge that you are here. Lord, would you meet us in the word this morning? In the power of your name. Amen. It was 1.30 in the morning again. <laughs> I say again because over the past oh, two and a half years or so, I've seen 1.30 in the morning almost every night. Our children have sleep problems. Many of you have experienced this, I'm sure, in your own lives, or insomnia as adults. But there have been so many not quite mornings that I have cried out to God. Do you even care? in my sleep. Are you even there listening to me pray? Why is this such a difficult thing for our children to learn? I have felt abandoned by God sometimes, as if he didn't even notice that I was there. And I don't know if you've ever felt that way, that God wasn't listening, or that God didn't care. But there was one night, not too long ago, when I felt like God finally responded, just a, a hint of a whisper, not even like a full sentence, but it was just this feeling, this thought, this idea that he hasn't changed, even if my sleep patterns have changed. He's still God. Today as we look at Malachi chapter 1, we're going to get a picture of this same type of message from the Lord. He hasn't changed. Even if the people feel like he has abandoned them. Even if the people feel like he's not worth worshiping anymore. God is still God. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I will take all the amens and the hand claps and the hallelujahs this morning. My soul needs it with the little sleep that I got this week. So if you have your Bibles, open them with me to Malachi chapter 1. Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament, so if you know where Matthew is, just look at the page before Matthew. There might be a title page that says New Testament. Look before that page. Malachi has four chapters. It's a tiny little book. And we're going to read Malachi chapter 1. A prophecy. The word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord. But you ask, how? How have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. And I have turned his hill country into a wasteland and left his inheritance to the desert jackals. Edom may say, though we have been crushed, we will rebuild the ruins. But this is what the Lord of angel armies says. They may build, but I will demolish. They will be called the wicked land, a people always under the wrath of the Lord. You will see it with your own eyes and say, Great is the Lord even beyond the borders of Israel. A son honors his father, and a slave his master. If I am father, where is the honor due me? If I am master, where is the respect due me? Says the Lord of angel armies. It is you, priests, who show contempt for my name. But you ask, how have we shown contempt for your name? By offering defiled food on my altar. But you ask, how have we defiled you? By saying that the Lord's table is contemptible. When you offer blind animals for sacrifice, is that not wrong? When you sacrifice lame or diseased animals, is that not wrong? Try offering them to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you, says the Lord of angel armies? Now plead with God to be gracious to us. With such offerings from your hands, will he accept you, says the Lord of angel armies? Oh, that one of you would just shut the temple doors so that you would not light useless fires on my altar. I am not pleased with you, 
says the Lord of angel armies, and I will accept no offering from your hands. My name will be great among the nations, from where the sun rises to where it sets. In every place, incense and pure offerings were brought to me, because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of angel armies. But you profane it by saying the Lord's table is defiled and its food is contemptible. And you say, what a burden. And you sniff at it contemptuously, says the Lord of angel armies. When you bring injured, lame, or diseased animals and offer them as sacrifices, should I accept them from your hands, says the Lord? Cursed is the cheat who has an acceptable male in his flock and vows to give it, but then sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord of angel armies, and my name is to be feared among the nations. There are three things I want us to notice in the passage this morning. The first is that Israel was chosen by God. The second is that Israel neglected their relationship with God. And the third is that God responds in a surprising way. You may have noticed in the first few verses that God says, I have loved Jacob and Esau I have loved him. Now, I want us to understand a little bit of the context here. This is, this is traditional covenant vocabulary. It's not the same way we would say, I love you, I hate you, you're kind of smelly and gross, or whatever. God is saying, I chose Israel. I chose Israel, and I rejected Esau. So in the broader context of this story, Israel, chosen by God, given a land, given kings, and then, because of all the failures they had over hundreds and hundreds of years, they were taken into exile. They were conquered by Assyrians, by the Babylonians, by the Persians. The Assyrians and the Babylonians took them away from their land, far away. But the Persians, even though they conquered, they said, you can go back to your land. You can return to Jerusalem, rebuild the walls, rebuild the temple. And so the people went back with joy, back to their nation, still under control by the Persians. But they rebuilt their cities, and they started to rebuild the temple. And then they lost their passion somewhere along the way. And the temple was rebuilt, but the priests became corrupt, and the people stopped caring about how to worship the Lord. Malachi's word comes to them during this time, when they're experiencing frustration about their relationship with God. The people neglected the law under the leadership of these corrupt priests. Malachi's sermons and the response of the people gives us a picture into the tension that they felt in this place of in between. They were in between the passion that they felt a long time ago and looking forward to a sign that was supposed to come someday. In between the old covenant fading away and the new covenant beginning. Malachi's message was the final wake up call to Israel. The next prophetic voice they would hear is the voice of one crying in the wilderness the voice of John the Baptist, 400 years later. And this is what Malachi has to say. Israel, you were chosen. God chose you. He rejected Esau. Edom, in that next verse, in verse 4, Edom is, more often than not, just a symbol of anyone who is an enemy of God. So he's saying, I rejected the enemies, the ones who hate me, the ones who won't follow me, won't listen to me. They're rejected. But Israel, you were chosen, and I love you. The reason that it was so important to God was because he chose them to have an intimate relationship with him that would reflect to the rest of the world who he was. God had a purpose. Israel. And they were beginning to neglect him again, to reject his word. Now God provided Israel with the law way back on Mount Sinai, a long, long time ago. 
And the reason that he gave them a law, because it was a, a road map for men to follow in their relationship with God. It wasn't supposed to be a bunch of rules that weighed them down and made them feel like slaves again. It was a place for them to follow God's word and connect with him, to grow in relationship with him. God called himself their king and their master in this passage, but he also called himself their father. And in other places in the Old Testament, we read that God calls himself their husband, that they were the bride. So we can see God's design for this relationship was supposed to be one of intimacy, as well as affection, in addition to honor and obedience. The law was part of the covenant that God made with Israel. The covenant was such a deep commitment, it's almost beyond our comprehension. Something that God would never, ever, ever, ever break, even though the people broke it over and over and over and over again. Malachi's message was a reminder of what they had left behind by neglecting the law, by neglecting their worship, and why it was so imperative for them to return to pure worship, to a pure relationship with God, out of love for their Heavenly Father. So Israel was chosen by God to have an intimate relationship, and they were also chosen to be a witness to the world of who God is. In verses 5, 11, and 14, we can see that God repeatedly says to the world, to the nations, everyone is going to hear about me. Everyone who worships me with pure heart is going to know me. I will be feared among the nations. So God's intention was not just that Israel would have a relationship with him, but that the whole world would have a relationship with him. One of the things that I found so fascinating about this passage is the title that Malachi uses for God is Yahweh Sabot, the Lord of hosts, or the Lord of heavenly hosts, or the Lord of angel armies. And the reason he chose this title is because it emphasizes the majestic sovereignty of God over all kingdoms and all nations and all rulers. God's ultimate goal was not that Israel would be his pet or his favorite, but that the whole world would see who he is. Israel was to be a witness to the world of who God is. Their pure and honest worship would declare this. But that goal of the whole world knowing kept being delayed by Israel's neglect and disobedience and rejection. God wanted the whole world to know him, and Israel kept failing in their part of the deal. So Israel was chosen by God, and Israel neglected their relationship with God. The law was very specific about what kinds of offerings could be brought before the Lord. They had to be pure. There were lots of laws about it, and everybody knew exactly what needed to be done. It was not news to them that they should bring pure offerings to God. So why didn't they? If this was so obvious, why did they try to cut corners or lie? There's a couple different possibilities. One is that because they were under Persian rule, they were impoverished, they had lots of taxes to pay, they didn't have a lot of money, they were sort of rebuilding everything, so they're trying to cut corners to save money. Well, it's possible, God does allude at the end of this passage that they had the right thing and they were trying to cheat God by bringing something less. I think there's something more going on here. Another possibility is that they had poor theological understanding because there was this prophet Haggai a few years before who prophesied that when the second temple was built, there would be great wealth and prosperity, and that wasn't happening. But also with this guy named Ezekiel who prophesied that the, restored, the, the Davidic covenant would be restored. They'd have kings again, like, D, like David, the most amazing king from their history. And that hadn't happened. They're still under Persian rule. And then there was this prophet, Jeremiah, who said that God would have a new covenant with his people. He'd write his law on their hearts. But they didn't feel like that had happened either. So it's quite possible that the people of Israel at this time, Malachi's audience, believed that God had failed them. He 
he hadn't done what he had promised. He was the one who was neglecting his people. But that's not the whole story. When we read this passage, we can see from the people's complaints and responses that this was much more about their attitude than their finances or their interpretation of the past prophet's words. They felt it was a burden. It was just too much to bring their best to God. I want you to put yourself in their shoes for a moment. I think we've all felt that way, haven't we? When I just don't have the energy, I just don't have the strength, I just don't have what it takes to give everything to God. And I think there's a difference between just being tired and choosing to not love God anymore. I think he understands when we're tired. I think he understands when we're fighting with depression or we've been experiencing trauma in our families. I think he understands that. But when it comes to our own willful disobedience of, I just don't want to because I don't feel like it and I don't think God really cares, I think that's different. I think that's when God is calling us to step up and out of whatever's going on in ourselves and to really understand and believe and even preach to ourselves like that song said this morning. Preach the gospel to ourselves. He is worth it. Mm -hmm. Now put yourself in God's shoes for a second. How would you feel if someone brought you a gift that was already used? Or how would your mother feel if on Christmas morning the package that she opened from you had been broken and was dirty? She probably wouldn't feel so appreciated or loved, right? But that's what God is saying. He's saying, it's not even a gift if you're bringing me something that's not perfect. Because you know what you're supposed to do, and you're not doing it. The people were so focused on the ritual, they had forgotten the relationship. Mm. They lost sight of how to worship God because they lost sight of who he is. They were only focused on what he could do for them, not on his identity as the God of angel armies, their father, their king, their husband. So Israel was chosen by God. Israel neglected the worship of God. And God responded in a surprising way. The first thing we read in this passage is that God says, I love you. And that's actually pretty remarkable for an opening sermon or an opening word from the Lord. There's so many times in scripture we read God saying other things. But this one, the last word he was giving his people before the Messiah comes, the last thing he was saying is, I love you. I think that's surprising out of all the things that God could have said. Yes, he does go on to give an indictment of their actions. Yes, he does go on to the rest of Malachi to tell them that bad things are coming if you don't change. But he starts, the first thing he says is, I love you. So we see that God responds in a surprising way by declaring that he loves Israel, that he is still worth worshiping because he hasn't changed. But one Old, Old Testament scholar that I read said this in a really great way, God, that Israel, Israel had a unique experience of God's revelation and redemption. They had a unique knowledge of the identity of the Lord as God. And that meant they had a unique responsibility to live in the midst of the nations in a manner that reflected the character of the Lord, expressed in the commands he gave them for their own good. God chose Israel for a purpose. They were the ones who could experience and know God because of the law. They were the ones who could tell about and show who this God of angel armies is to the rest of the world. The people of Israel were the ones God called to invite the world into his family. They were blessed to be a blessing. 
So the disobedience and the breaking of the covenant, the improper worship was not just about their own relationship with God. It was also about their witness to the world, the testimony about who God is. So God responded by declaring he loved Israel and also by saying that his ultimate goal was still in effect. The nations would know that he is God. The nations would worship him, even when Israel fails. He is still God. So, what does this mean for us? God still loves you and wants a relationship with you. Have you ever felt like God let you know? Have you ever felt like it, you just didn't have what it took to come to church, to worship, to read your Bible, to pray? Malachi's message reminds us that God is still worth all of the glory, all of the worship, all of the praise we can bring. With all of our hearts, with all of our souls, with all of our minds, with all of our strength, even when we don't feel like giving it. Even when we don't see the promises fulfilled that we have been waiting for. We can still offer our whole selves to God. Because he is still the one who loves us, who chose us, and who made covenant with us. This morning, we come to the Lord's table to celebrate the Lord's Supper. The people Malachi was preaching to disregarded the Lord's table, and that's the only place in the Old Testament where that phrase is used in Malachi chapter 1, the Lord's table. <laughs> they defiled it, they disregarded it, they didn't care. It was the place where they were taking their offerings and presenting them to God. And this morning, as we come to the Lord's table, it is a place where we recognize where the ultimate sacrifice took place. When God himself gave up everything he had for us. We may not now hold in our hands everything that God has promised us. There may be still a person you've been praying for to know Jesus. There may be a relationship that you've been praying for to be healed. There may be something that you've been longing for and hoping for and you, you want to see it happen and you're still waiting. We don't have all of those promises in our hands right now. We may not experience all of them until we get to heaven, to be honest. But in the midst of waiting, just like Israel was waiting for a new covenant, waiting for their Messiah, we can know that God is still the one who loves us and chooses us to be in his family and to be witnesses to the world. Communion reminds us that Jesus, who is fully God and fully human, paid the ultimate price with his own life, bearing the weight of all of our disobedience, all of our neglect of the law, all of our selfishness, and all of our sin. And when we break the bread, and we drink the cup. We remember that there is absolutely nothing that would stand between him and the price that he paid for us. God was willing to sacrifice everything so that we could be in relationship with him. So what is it that you are holding back from God this morning? In what way is your worship less than your best. And I'm not talking about singing better or giving more money or serving in more ways in the church. What I'm asking is, is your whole heart available to Jesus? When you take the bread and the cup this morning, remember how much Jesus sacrificed for you. And give him your whole self in return. I'll have the worship team come up now. Um, this morning we're going to take communion together. I'll invite you to um, come up. Charles, would you move this over here? I'll invite you to come up to the table and um, everyone.
everyone take a piece of bread and a cup and then return to your seats and wait when everyone's been served then we'll, we'll take it together <laughs> while the worship team plays so i'm going to pray over the elements and then while they um, play uh, the music for us you can all come forward and take the elements and then return to your seats and wait and then we've all been served then and we'll probably be taking them together 